everyone, it's Alex, and today I'm here to do my March wrap-up. By far, I would say March is actually my best reading month I had so far, so I really liked all of these books, and they, in particular, I had one five-star read, so I'm really excited to save that one for last. Starting off, I do want to talk about, with the first book, it wasn't my favorite one, but it was one that I think was definitely the most interesting, and that was Piranesi by Susanna Clark. Actually, Buddy read this book with Ben over at Doom Antidote, and I had a really great time messaging back and forth with Ben because this book is quite whimsical and plotty, which isn't exactly what I'm used to. In a way, I feel like I can't really describe much about this book because it is one of those books where it's really best to go in completely blind. But I can let you know it's about this man named Piranesi who's in this peculiar labyrinth where he's trying to navigate exactly why he's there and how he helps this particular character with investigating their own surroundings. And in this labyrinth, there are these statues that Piranesi considers real people. There are birds flying around. Sometimes the floor will just flood with water. And when I first started reading the elements to this book being stuff like this, I thought Clark would have a hard time trying to control exactly what the purpose of all these things would be within her world building of exactly how the plot would be carried as well. And overall, while I think this book is a mystery, I think really the success of it isn't exactly trying to feel preoccupied by a sense of creative world building, but rather how believable it feels from Piranesi's perspective of really his exposure and his adjustment to all of these things because he's been in this place for quite a while. Because I think a facet of this book is in its own way challenging the reader in determining how much fiction is too much fiction? And why is it when something is literally fictional with what we see or hear, if it's any more less important based on how it makes us feel? I myself was very surprised with the ending of this book, but I really liked it a lot with kind of what, I, what it sort of like pulled off for me. I'll stop there, that way I don't say too much, but I would definitely pick up Piranesi as it's been long listed for the Woman's Prize, so I'm really curious what more people will think of it. Another buzzy book I read this month was Milk Fed by Melissa Broder. I read The Pisces by Broder in 2019 and I was really surprised by how much I enjoyed it. And now with Milk Fed, I think it really does cement Broder as this writer that uses imagination as this portal of sort of determining one's own threshold for desire. In Milk Fed, we follow a character by the name of Rachel who's very aggressively thinking about her weight pretty often, but she's also a stand-up comedian, so she's very self-aware in terms of her relationship with her own presence in the entertainment industry. So yet again, Broder, like in the Pisces, uh, she does the same here, where she never spares her protagonists to feel like they're in this awful environment. But it's also interesting that Broder positions Rachel in these circumstances that may only fuel her disordered eating. Having Rachel's behavior with her eating feel like these disillusioned sanctuaries from these very public environments that she inhabits. That being said, I do think it's interesting that Rachel continues to pursue these public perceptions of relationships with other people, sort of testing what the limits are of her own self-indulgence with her behavior whenever exposed to other people, with Los Angeles as this perfect, uncanny backdrop. Otherwise, Milk Fed had a lot of similar beats to the Pisces in terms of like desire and sex that I found a bit repetitive with this sort of second go-around reading her. For in the Pisces, I thought the concept of self-destructive behavior was interesting because of its relationship with literal imaginary beings. Milk Fed sometimes felt very uncannily suffocating with its constant surveillance, in this case of one's capabilities with one's body. So overall I think Broder is someone who I really enjoy ideas from, but I don't know if they always work for me in the terms of being a story. Specifically with Rachel, I thought that Broder actually did a much better job with characterizing her within LA, so I think I would really love to see a short story collection from Broder in the future. So now moving on to a couple of nonfiction I read this month, with the first one being the Copenhagen Trilogy by Tove Ditlevsen. This is a collection of Ditlevsen's previously published memoirs, and they are called Childhood, Youth, and Dependency. And its structure is based on, as you might have guessed, the chronology of how Ditlevsen kind of considers her life in these three pivotal areas. And Childhood, as you might have guessed, is about Ditlevsen's childhood, really carving out her desire and realization for wanting to be a writer. In her quest to being a writer, I think the real payoff of childhood is just how well Ditlevsen is able to vividly characterize her family and their, not disdain, but their just very 
realistic opposition to her ideas of being a writer. And across these memoirs, the writing itself is actually very plain, which I think is actually to its advantage. With Copenhagen as the main backdrop to all of these memoirs, it really feels much more alive on the basis of Ditlefsen's very calculated observations. For example, with childhood being able to unearth all of these very unique personas that manifest within her family, it nearly feels like this collection reads a lot like fiction. But in that way of like a collective conscious of time and place really reminding me a lot of the Neapolitan novels by Elena Fronte, which is supposedly based or is at least very autobiographical. It really feels like Ditlevson leaves no stone unturned as she will openly talk about things like love, sex, her marriage, and addiction. And particularly thinking about what it means to be a woman within this time with no less Hitler's rise to power in the background of her life. I just really liked reading this collection a lot. I loved it, Left's in Sense of Voice, and I'm definitely gonna pick up one of her novels soon. And if anything, with this collection, there's one part that really sold me whenever a boy goes up to Levson and compliments her writing, and she basically wonders, is he single and can I marry him? And the other work of nonfiction I read this month is The Cost of Living by Deborah Levy. This is the second installment in Levy's series of memoirs with the first one being Things I Don't Want to Know. And with Things I Don't Want to Know, I really liked it because having read Levy's fiction book, Hot Milk, before reading her memoirs, I felt like I got deeper insight into her relationship between memory and childhood. Meanwhile, in The Cost of Living, I thought it was a great expansion and even like a better sequel to Things I Don't Want to Know in being more sort of conscious with its sense of storytelling within it being about real life, with a particular standout being Levy's sections about her relationship with her mother. And with Levy now being able to speak more towards her own sense of real time, since the cost of living is about her adulthood, it also talks about her growth into her writing career. Having this memoir be a constant sort of contribution to a series of moments where Levy felt like she was just well onto her way of being something she always wanted to be. Seeing writing as a respite and responsibility for providing her these illuminations and also her own livelihood and being able to continuously diagnose what it means to be in touch with oneself. But yeah, the third installment of these micro memoirs, um, I think it's called Real Estate, comes out later this year, so I'm really excited to pick it up. And finally, we've made it to the final book for this month, or for March, and it's my favorite book I read, and that is A True Novel by Manai Mizumura. I read this book for March of the Mammoths, where it's a readathon that I really love for booktube, and its goal is to read a book that's 800 or more pages. So because I love to suffer, but also because I heard that this book is a retelling of Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte, I was really keen to pick it up. And I know in a few past videos, I've advocated this book as a retelling of Wuthering Heights, which is true, but I do think it is a bit of a disservice to purely call it that just because of its overwhelming sort of context to Japanese literature. We open with this book with a fictionalized version of Manai Mizumura through an auto-fictional lens of knowing that she's writing this book. Please don't click away. So in the time that we are introduced to this fake Mizumura self and her family, we do get this summary within this prologue section between their successes and failures within their life. And within that summary, we do get an introduction to this mysterious brooding man named Taro. And this prologue section kind of ends on the basis of understanding that Taro is someone employed by the Mizumura family, and he does have this quite sort of rags to riches story. So after this prologue section, we do get introduced to this new section about Taro's life being recounted to us by this woman named Fumiko, who served as a caretaker of sorts to Taro in his childhood and adolescence. I'll go ahead and let you know, just for the consistency of this retelling aspect of Wuthering Heights, that Taro represents Heathcliff and Nellie Dean from Wuthering Heights is Fumiko. But refreshingly, with Fumiko giving this subjective history of Taro's life, we also get these wonderful sort of descriptions of love and passion and sacrifice. Set in the backdrop of post-war Japan, I particularly really loved Wuthering Heights in general, but I do feel like in a way a true novel goes above and beyond with its description or its ability to really root these inspired characters in this much more established and 
more empathetic world. In Mizumura, the author, Mizumura of a True Novel, is so conscious and dedicated to giving her characters these respites of opportunity that really satisfy their shifts and growth in their behavior. Paired against or alongside or maybe in contrast to each character's own sense of their privilege within the context or the cultural context of maybe growing up in Japan and as it's that in itself is very nicely contrasted with the ideas of maybe what it's like to grow up in America thanks to the prologue introduction. And for those of you holding your breath waiting for me to mention who Catherine portrays from Wuthering Heights, we have the character Yoko. And through Yoko's own sort of oral history from Fumiko, we do understand this relationship, but then that blur of subjectivity with Yoko's own position of privilege as well. But the whole reason this story exists is because the fictionalized Manai Mizumura is inspired, apart from Japanese literature, in the concept of the I novel versus a true novel. An I novel in Japanese literature is maybe more reflective of what we might consider as being just autofiction. So this framing is utterly fascinating to me while reading a true novel, being that this fictionalized Manai Mizumura came up with characters like Fumiko within this fictional inspired retelling of the real book of Wuthering Heights. <laughs> I'm gonna stop talking because I feel like I'm already losing people. But overall, I'm just so infinitely impressed how well characterized these characters are from a sense of being from their inspired origins really in some ways just breathes life into this story that is a tale as old as time but somehow feels like this larger contribution to still that sense of what I look for from books, the sort of humdrum nature of life in the most very plain and innocent but still highly profound way. Especially how Mizumura is able to create this hybrid of weaving in this cultural context of Japan as the backdrop of the story while also giving me those nice flavors of a doomed romance. And with Mizumura's completely lucid writing, there are so many different opportunities of just soaking in these wonderful descriptions of Japan itself. Even if I've never been there, I just feel like I have based on her writing. Stories in Japan didn't exist until a true novel by Manai Mizumura. I always feel like I have to say her full like name with the title because it just feels correct. So yeah, those were all the books that I read in March. So if you read any of these books, I would love to know what you think. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it for me. I'm really looking forward to what I have lined up in April, so I'm really excited to see you again next month whenever I do my April wrap-up. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.